Hi, it's Daryl again, and this is a new type of video I'm going to try, and I'm going to explain uh, about a problem with the climate change and the loss of ice in the Arctic Ocean. Um, so I did this video for my brother. I've explained this to him before, but he was like, oh, you should just record exactly what you explained and uh, put it on YouTube so that other people can listen to and understand. So this is a, a view of Google Earth. Here's the Arctic Ocean, and this is the part of the ocean that is normally covered by ice. And until, I don't know, a couple of decades ago, two or three decades ago, it was basically covered in ice all the time. And now it's mostly covered in ice, but we're getting to the point where the ice is melting so fast because of climate change this is going to cause weather destabilization and so we're already suffering weather destabilization um, understand that the northern hemisphere is experiencing a lot of extra rain which it didn't used to um, experience and the reason for this is because each time the temperature of the water de increases by one degree c the amount of evaporation coming off the surface of the water increases by about 7%. So if you increase the ocean temperature 2 degrees, you'll get 14% more evaporation. And then because there's more water up in the sky, when it does rain, it's going to rain harder for longer, which means that in places that you didn't used to get flooding, you'll get flooding, and the f flooding will be more and for a longer periods of time and as the sea temperature increases it will be more more and longer longer and so this is a problem and so that stems from system destabilization so normally the arctic ocean is being covered in ice which means that when it's covered in ice water doesn't evaporate off of it but now we're getting to the point where each summer the a lot of the ocean is open for a longer and longer period of time near the end of each northern hemisphere summer which means that you're going to get more unexpected weather so because you have more water in the atmosphere and more water in the atmosphere causes the weather to be stronger for longer and then more so than that is that because the ocean has always been very cold the ice has made kept the weather stable above the ice so because the ice was frozen over over the whole ocean there it meant that the weather states the the weather system stayed anchored on the North Pole and that meant that the wind blew around the pole in an orderly way which we call jet stream. The jet stream was stable, its position was stable and predictable which meant that the ensuing weather systems in the northern hemisphere were stable and predictable. But now that we're getting to the point where most of the ice is gone, the body of cold air that sits atop the world has been slipping off and it's changing shape which means that the jet stream weather which runs around the divide between the warmer temperate regions and the cold arctic regions the line is moving and wandering all over the place which means that you get un unexpected weather at unexpected times and that is a big problem also the problem is is that this is self-reinforcing as well because when the water was covered in ice and the land was covered in snow that would be the case in the spring and into the summer and that would reflect the uh, sunlight away which would stop the water and land from warming as fast but now that we've destabilized the system that means that the snow and ice melts earlier in the season which means that the sunlight coming in heats the water and heats the land um, earlier and faster during the spring and summer. Then the chain reaction problem is that um, once the ice has um, melted off the water, the water is darker than ice and it absorbs more energy from the sun so it heats faster and quicker as well. And so that means that once this problem um, gets to a certain point you just end up with runaway heating because it heats earlier because the ice melts off the water earlier each spring and it warms for longer over the summer through to the autumn 
and then um, because it was warmer when winter came around it means that it's still a little bit warmer when spring comes around so the next year it, it mounts earlier so that you get to the point that once once this is got to a certain point it just keeps self-reinforcing and that's called a positive feedback loop and you think like so how does that affect us well it affects you because you get more rains and storms and unexpected weather so it will be drier when you don't expect it and wetter when you don't expect it The further problem is, is that a lot of food is grown in the Northern Hemisphere, strangely enough. There's a lot of uh, grain growing going on all around the um, uh, Northern Hemisphere. You've got Europe and China and the United States and Canada, where the majority of, I think, of all of the grain in the world is grown in these places, like here in the sort of um, these nice flat bits of land in the United States and in Canada. And when your weather gets really unstable, it means that the that means that you'll get unexpected frosts and unexpected droughts that will happen more and more often and they'll be stronger which means you'll end up producing this food and so they're saying that for each degree C the world warms you might reduce food production by 10 or 12 I've heard 17 percent as well and um, I think at the moment we have about 30 percent more food calories growing each year than what the people in the world consume but if it's if it's fifteen percent loss and you heat two degrees like the Paris Climate Accord wants to be the limit, you're at twenty or thirty percent crop loss already, which means that people are going to start going hungry because food distribution's not that good. And um, then once people start going hungry, they'll they'll destabilize their governments and they'll leave their countries to try and find food and you'll end up with a whole chain reaction of political and social problems so I don't know what you can do to fix this well I do know what you can do to fix it you have to basically stop burning fossil fuels and I mean like really you have to stop it's not just go it used to be that we could have, could have got away with um, moving to more efficient cars but you know I've been on this planet for about 40 years and cars haven't really got much more efficient in my lifetime. Oh yeah, there's a few there's a few more efficient cars and I've owned one or two of those. But generally um, uh, people make up with their more efficient cars by uh, driving more, which is called uh, Jevons paradox, which isn't exactly right. It's actually our transport demands are effectively economically inelastic, which means that if you've got a more efficient car, you actually don't drive it um, way way more if you just use that car to drive to work and pick up the kids from school and go to the shops you don't just automatically go to work more times or drive to the shops more times or pick up the kids from school more times because you've got a more efficient car there are some things that you might do because because you might get to the end of your your weekend you've still got you know half a tank of petrol and then you're like oh well I can uh, go out to a cafe in the countryside during the weekend just to have a cup of tea and and that's that's nice but effectively um, we have to curtail our use of fossil fuels extremely quickly um, so I did this video for my brother I've explained this to him before but he was like oh you should just record exactly what you explained and uh, put it on YouTube so that other people can listen to and understand that. Uh, thanks for watching and listening. Uh, it wasn't a very dramatic video but it's just uh, just a little chat that I had with my brother and he just thought it was a good idea to explain it to other people. Thank you.